non-repudiation, the last security goal of cryptography that we in this course will have a closer look at is the security goal demanding that in a system with non-repudiation, the source of information can be verified by any third party and not necessarily a party involved in the exchange of the information, but any third party. The key cryptographic concept serving the security goal of non-reputation are digital signature systems. Digital signature systems are systems where the state of information is captured in a digital signature that is then attached to the information. These digital signatures are calculated based on the private key of a participant in such a system. Once such a digital signature for a plain text is created based on the private key of a participant, then this digital signature can be verified by using the public key corresponding to the private key, which verifies that the digital signature matches the plain text and that the digital signature was created with the corresponding private key. As such, it's clear that the source of information can be verified to be the participant in possession of this private key and that this can be verified by arbitrary third parties. Speaking briefly under the hood of digital signatures, a digital signature is often just a hash of the plain text encrypted with the private key of the participant and verifying a digital signature amounts to decrypting this encrypted hash with the public key corresponding to the private key and comparing the decrypted hash with a recalculated hash of the received plain text. If a cryptographic hash function is used to hash the plain text, then digital signatures can bind the signature to the plain text down to each and every single bit. Wrapping this Essentials of Cryptography chapter up is now best done by looking at an application of both encryption and digital signatures in an approach known as sign then encrypt of data. This may look complex and intimidating, but the motivation to nevertheless trying to understand this is that at the very end of this course, we will have built from scratch an X509 PKI that can be used to secure the exchange of emails. At the very core of securing emails and speaking from a cryptographic point of view, what happens when emails are properly secured is that they are protected by this worry approach of signed and encrypt of data. So this concept is very much worth to be discussed and understood. In order to discuss this application, let's assume that the scenario is that Alice wants to send Bob an email that is both confidential so that only Bob can read it and that Bob can verify that the email received has been sent by Alice. The precondition for this is that Alice owns a public private key pair for the purpose of creating and verifying digital signatures and that Bob owns a public private key pair for the purpose of encrypting and decrypting data. In a very first step, Alice, as the sender of the email, now first creates a digital signature for the email, which she creates by making use of her private key, of her public-private digital signature key pair. This results in a signature that she will attach to the email. Then, in a second step, Alice creates a completely new, randomly sampled symmetric key K, and this symmetric key K is then the key that Alice uses to symmetrically encrypt the email and the attached digital signature with AES into a ciphertext. At this point, it's only Alice that knows about the symmetric key. So in order for Alice to enable Bob to later access this email, Alice needs to make this symmetric key accessible to Bob. The way that Alice does this in this signed and encrypt approach is by taking the public key of the public private encryption key pair of Bob and with this public encryption key of Bob, Alice then asymmetrically encrypts the symmetric key K with RSA, which results in an encrypted symmetric key K. Now Alice has both an encrypted email with a touch signature and an encrypted symmetric key. Both of these Alice then sends to Bob, knowing that ultimately only Bob, 
who is the only one in possession of the corresponding private decryption key, can recover the symmetric key K that Alice just freshly generated, and that with this, it will only be Bob that can ultimately access the email that was sent by Alice. Bob, once having access to the email, can then use the public digital signature verification key of Alice to verify that it really was Alice that originally sent the email. The details of the actions to conduct by Bob are left as an exercise, but are essentially just walking backwards through the steps that Alice took before she sent out her email. Before we conclude this chapter with the essentials of cryptography, let's briefly discuss this sign then encrypt of data. To begin, sign then encrypt is a standard approach provided by cryptography and is the approach recommended even knowing that one could actually go the other way around with an encrypt then sign approach with this however assumed to be less secure. Now sticking with just the sign then encrypt approach, in order for this approach to really work, Alice needs to be completely sure that the public encryption key she uses is really the key belonging to Bob, as otherwise someone else instead of Bob would be able to read the email. On the other hand, Bob needs to be sure that the public key he uses to verify the digital signature is the key belonging to Alice, as otherwise the email may have been sent by someone else than Alice that Merle may claim to be Alice instead of actually being Alice. From this, we understand that both Alice and Bob need to have trust in the authenticity of the public keys that they use, and to establish this trust in the public keys used by Alice and Bob is a challenge that may be solved by multiple different approaches. A first approach to providing trust to Alice and Bob into the keys that they use could be by having a system with a trusted third party providing a public registry of the keys of all the participants in the system. With such a trusted third party trusted to only keep and hand out authentic copies of the keys, both Alice and Bob could indeed obtain trust in the authenticity of the keys that they will use. However, if a system really would go for a trusted third party as an attempt to providing authenticity to the keys used, this trusted third party would soon be a bottleneck in the system with the requirement to constantly being online. This requirement and the load on the trusted third party would very soon reach its limit with respect to the size of the system it could support and thus, in the end, is not a practical solution to aim for when trying to provide authenticity to the keys used. A second approach to providing authenticity to the keys used in a system can be provided by a trusted institution issuing certificates with a certain lifetime and with these certificates assigning public keys to entities like Alice and Bob. A trusted institution like this is essentially exactly what X509 PKIs are set out to be, and we are just about to get to know how these X509 PKIs now really work and how X509 PKIs manage to provide authenticity to the cryptographic public keys used to secure digital information systems.